Hi there, I'm Alistair Leith, the lead author of the Send Jobs Report 2020 and co convener of Outreach at Sustainable Energy Now. I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Jajawaran country, part of the Kulin Nation in Victoria, and hi to you, all of you gathered on Noongar country. I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. SEN is short for Sustainable Energy Now. We're a volunteer-run think tank that's for years provided rigorous analysis for the most cost-effective pathways to decarbonising Western Australia's energy grids and remote regions. We offer advice and attempt to influence the WA government towards embracing climate action policies in the energy sector and encourage them to succeed when facing the challenges of the need to rapidly transition away from fossil fuels. If you're intrigued or inspired by what we do, we're a volunteer-run organisation and we're always looking for new members and volunteers who can bring fresh skills, be it marketing, events, outreach or social media, right through to policy expertise, computational and economic modelling and so forth. There's quite a bit of material in this presentation. Some of it I'm just going to click through uh, just so that you know it's there and you can check out the slides later or even download the Send Jobs report for lots more info. This is a quick light outline of what we're going to cover, the jobs in the jobs report, the energy model which is part of the jobs report and why it's 90% renewables, not some other number, where the jobs are located, what technologies and what types of jobs that we see. Then have a quick look at the 90% renewables and how that fits into the bigger picture of decarbonising the entire economy, the so-called 700% renewable energy superpower. And then we're going to look at um, what that plays out to 2050, both on and off the Swiss grid in terms of employment. So 90% renewables, 700% renewables, is it 9,000 jobs or 55,000 jobs or 350,000 or 1.8 million? A lot of the differences are apparent but not real. It's mainly just terminology and what we're actually looking at. SEN's always had a focus on the Swiss grid, which is a small part of the overall emissions picture in WA, but a very important part, and I'm going to cover that more closely later on. It's about a quarter of emissions in WA that are on the Swiss grid, but it's a critical part of the decarbonising story because it's the key to decarbonising other sectors uh, if they feel switch away from fossil fuels to more efficient electric solutions. This is the sort of assumptions and dependencies, not going to talk about it except to say the employment factors are based on the most rigorous and recent renewables jobs research done by Clean Energy Council. This is the stepped transition to 90% renewables by 2030. So on this graph, 2015 to 2020 is historical data. 21 to 30 is our proposed transition. See, we take a lot of coal out straight away because there's excess capacity and we can do that. Obviously, that didn't happen this year. This report was written 2019, 2020. We could have done it and we would have been fine as far as the grid goes. There is a transition story for those workers that are currently working in those coal plants. Uh, Hazelwood in Victoria employs around 300 people in mine site remediation, demolition, um, decommissioning and that's about the size of the WA coal industry, um, that single plant and mine in Victoria. Those jobs have been ongoing for a few years and they will continue to go for a few years. This is the same information seen another way, so it's cumulative, builds up over time. Uh, you see the fossil fuel being phased out, the thermal in the top three and the bottom three um, generation sources ramping up. Not linear, slightly exponential storage as well. We see two types of batteries, commercial batteries, big batteries like Hornsdale, which paid itself off in less than two years. We see them getting into the market straight away. AMO would love to see a few of them on the Swiss grid for energy security services. They can get into the money straight away in the market and pay themselves off. Domestic batteries, less so at the moment, but as they hit that sweet spot, we expect to see adoption rise quite smartly. The last part of that 2030 picture is the commissioning of pumped hydro energy storage, which we have in this model. That's for that deep storage. You can see the dotted line shows the depth of storage that shoots right up, almost quadrupling 
once that hydro comes online, that gives you that kind of 10 hours depth of storage, which is really important for the, um, for the depths of winter. Four types of jobs in the jobs model, manufacturing, construction and installation, operations and maintenance and decommissioning, including the decommissioning of fossil fuels because coal and gas are going to have to be retired. So that's part of the jobs picture and certainly part of the transition picture for existing workers. There's also transmission line jobs. We actually have it as a separate category in the model. Here is the jobs that energy model requires to build and maintain that energy model out to 2030. You can see a lot of it is construction, indicated in yellow on this graph. This whole energy transition is predicated on government policies that create the right environment so you get a steady pipeline of wind farms and solar farms and batteries being deployed. The worst thing for the industry is boom and bust. It has bad social impacts and it has bad effects for investment and commercial realities. The market is not conducive the way it's constructed on the Swiss to a rapid transition out of fossil fuel and in fact there's a lot of impediments and unless the government sorts that out it's going to be a real problem getting more renewables on the grid, particularly in a timely fashion by for a 20-30-90% renewables grid. This is another graph which is exactly the same data but it's filtered a different way. It's showing this, these, these same jobs but filtered by the technology that they're actually in. A lot of jobs in pumped hydro because there's a lot of construction around that. Anything involving concrete involves a lot of manual labour. One more third way I'm going to show you a split for regional and metro, so about 60-40 split, favouring regional, that's important for existing regional communities but also for new regional communities that will emerge in the best areas for renewable resources, so that's north of Perth rather than south of Perth because it's just better solar and wind up there. And once the transmission goes in, as we've seen with the last three wind farms built in WA, they, they, they went in there in rapid succession when that transmission became available. So let's take another look at this 90% by 2030 in terms of an end goal to become 700% RE-powered industrial superpower. If the last 10% on the Swiss is the most expensive, how can we affordably get to 700% RE? 70 times the amount of power required to finish the decarbonising on the Swiss to get to 700%. The answer is that there needs to be two transitions happening in parallel. We go hard and fast on the Swiss immediately because we can, while industrial minerals processing, fabrication, space industries and energy exports are proposed to happen at a much larger scale but requiring more startup runway before they're commercial and move from pilots to full-scale production. A lot of runway is required in fact given where the technologies are today for producing so-called green steel, green fuels or e-fuels. Once we have 700% renewables perhaps in the north, perhaps some of it even within the Swiss footprint, all of a sudden a lot of different things happen. You start to have a lot of overbuild of renewable energy technologies and that means a lot of surplus renewable energy with no place to go. That creates opportunities for new industries with cheap energy, it creates opportunities for storage, it creates opportunities for cost-effective transmission links, potentially power to gas technologies, power to fuel, uh, hydrogen storage which is um, in a massive hype cycle at the moment but potentially a game changer. Uh, hydrogen transmission over 150 kilometres is actually more cost effective than electrical transmission if you need hydrogen at the other end. You lose efficiencies in converting it back to electricity, uh, e-fuels and the like. This is what happens when we look at the jobs on the grid out past 2030 what we proposed in the jobs report was to say, okay, there's potentially all this uh, new industry happening with cheap renewables in WA and minerals processing, energy exports and so forth. What if we were able to maintain that rate of construction that we see in 2030 and just keep that going? That's a minute fraction of what you would need to um, convert even, say, a quarter of iron exports to green steel. Uh, it's a small portion of what you would need to replace LNG exports with hydrogen or ammonia or some kind of other hydrogen-based fuel. So 
we took a pretty conservative look at it, but we just said, what, what happens with the jobs if you continue? And some interesting things emerge. Those maintenance jobs, which you see with the dotted blue line, they just keep going. They keep accumulating and you end up there with over 5,000 jobs in just in operations and maintenance. That's five times the size of the coal sector when it was at its peak. You also get an interesting thing. It's like when painting the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they start at one end, by the time they get to the other, it's time to start back at the start again. Same thing with renewables. They've got a lifetime of 20 to 40 years, depending on the technology. And you get into a cycle where you actually are decommissioning wind turbines and installing new ones on the same site. And so there's perpetuation of the, of the jobs in construction. It's just an ongoing thing. What's holding us back in WA? This is a graph of 30 years of energy emissions. Emissions are, are skyrocketing, the complete opposite of what we need in a climate crisis. Uh, a lot of that's driven by LNG, but at the same time we're doing nothing to bring that down in the Swiss, which is where we can do it immediately and easily. So just a bit of a word about sustainable energy now. This is who we are, this is what we do. This is me. Please get in touch if you're interested in talking more about this sort of thing or contributing to SEN's efforts to try and get adoption of a 90% renewables plan for 2030. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time.